let us now move to labor organizations. When we say labor organization, it is an association of employees created for collective bargaining. Common types of labor organization are local union, which is a labor organization operating at the enterprise level. We have national union or federation, which is a labor organization with at least 10 local chapters or affiliates, each of which must be a collective bargaining agent. Then we have uh, independent union, which is a labor organization that acquired legal personality through independent registration and is not affiliated with a federation or national union. And then we also have local chapter, which refers to a labor organization without an independent registration, but its legal personality is derived from its mother union or federation. Then we have affiliate, which is an independent union attached to a national union or federation. Who are qualified to form or join a labor organization? Well, there are only two, rank and file and supervisors. Rank and file are those who are neither managerial or supervisory. On the other hand, supervisory employees are those who, in the interest of the employer, effectively recommend managerial action, such as laying down and execution of management policies, hiring, transfer, dismissal, or discipline of employees. If the exercise of such authority is not veterinary or clerical, but requires the use of independent judgment. The supervisory status of an employee is determined not by his position title, but by the nature of the employee's function. The mere designation of an employee as chief mechanic, chief welder, or chief carpenter is not necessarily indicative of supervisory status. Such designation merely connotes that he is the number one mechanic, number one welder, number one carpenter among the many of the same category. The point to consider is whether the employee has the power to effectively recommend the laying down and execution of management policies, including personnel movement, using his independent judgment. Although supervisors and rank and file are accorded the right to form or join a labor union, they cannot lump together into a single union. They should form their own separate organization. The reason for the segregation is the difference in their interest. In the area of collective bargaining, the, their interests are not identical because the needs of one are different from those of the other. In the implementation of disciplinary rules, supervisors act contrary to the interest of the rank and file whenever they recommend the implementation of a management policy or whenever they ask for discipline or dismissal of subordinates. Now, even though supervisors and rank and file workers in the same establishment cannot lump into a single union, the union of supervisors and the union of rank and file can validly affiliate with the same federation. How about alien employees? Can they form or join a labor organization? Well, they can. They can join a labor organization if they have valid employment permits and their country grants the same rights to Filipino workers. Aliens who are not employees cannot organize or assist in organizing a union because Article 284 of the Labor Code prohibits them from engaging in all forms of trade union activities. So let us now go to the disqualification. Now, who are disqualified from forming or joining a labor organization? We have managerial employees. Second are confidential employees who have access to labor relations information. Third are employees, members of cooperatives. Fourth are government employees. Fifth are employees of government-owned or controlled corporations, whether chartered or non-chartered, ambulant workers, or those without definite employers. Let us first discuss managerial employees. Now, who are considered managerial employees? Well, managerial employees are those vested with powers or prerogatives to lay down and execute management policies or to hire, transfer, suspend, lay off, or recall, or discharge, or discipline employees. The managerial status of an employee is determined not by the name or position title, but by the nature of his functions. 
The point to consider is whether the employee possesses authority to lay down and execute management policies and other managerial actions such as hiring, transfer, discipline, or dismissal of employees. So, the mere fact that an employee is designated as manager does not ipso facto make him one. Faculty members are not managerial employees, and therefore they are not disqualified from forming or joining a labor organization. So, what is the legal basis for disqualifying managerial employees? Well, the legal basis is Article 255 of the Labor Code, which says that managerial employees are not eligible to join, assist, or form any labor organization. What is the reason for the disqualification? Well, the reason for the disqualification is the evident conflict of interest brought about by the nature of their position. So, if managerial employees are allowed to form or join a union, the employer might not be assured of their loyalty. Second, the disqualification refers to confidential employees. For purposes of disqualification, confidential employees are those who formulate, determine, and effectuate management policies in the field of labor relations. Therefore, to be disqualified, the confidential relationship must pertain to matters pertaining to labor relations. So, not all confidential employees are disqualified from forming or joining a labor organization. Only those who have access to labor relations information are disqualified. Employees who have access to information which is confidential from the business standpoint, like financial information, trade secrets, marketing strategies, are not disqualified from forming or joining a labor union. Now, what is the legal basis for disqualification? Well, legal basis is the doctrine of necessary implication, which states that what is implied in a statute is much a part thereof as that which is expressed. Applying this doctrine, the disqualification accorded to managerial employees equally applies to confidential employees because in the normal course of their duties, they become aware of management policies relating to labor relations. And the reason for disqualification is the potential conflict of interest. If confidential employees who have access to labor relations information are allowed to unionize, they could be governed by their own personal motives. Along the same line of reasoning, confidential employees may become the source of undue advantage because said employees may act as spies of either party in the collective bargaining negotiation, considering that in the normal course of their duties, they become aware of management policies relating to labor relations. The next disqualification referred to employees who are members of cooperatives. To fall within the disqualification, the employee must at the same time be a member of the cooperative. The disqualification does not extend to employees who are not members of the cooperative. And the reason for the disqualification is because members are co-owners of the cooperative. And therefore, since they are co-owners, they cannot bargain with themselves. Next disqualification refers to government employees. Government employees cannot form a labor organization because the terms and conditions of their employment are fixed by law. And such being the case, only Congress can improve the terms and conditions of employment. In short, the terms and conditions of employment of government employees cannot be improved through collective bargaining. Now, how about employees of government-owned or controlled corporations? There are two kinds of government-owned or controlled corporations. First are those with original charters, and second are those organized under the corporation law. Employees of uh, government-owned or controlled corporations with original charter cannot form or join a labor organization because they are governed by the civil service law. On the other hand, government-owned or controlled corporations established under the corporation law cannot form a labor organization because of the GOCC Governance Act of 2011, which established a compensation and position classification system for all government-owned or controlled corporations, whether chartered or non-chartered. 
Uh, I want you to remember that GOCCs or Government Owner Control Corporations established under the Corporation Code are still governed by the Labor Code. This is illustrated by the case of GSIS Family Bank. In this case, the bank was organized under the corporation law. Now, it became a government-controlled corporation because the GSIS acquired 99% of its shares. That is why the name was changed to GSIS Family Bank. In June 2011, the GOCC Governance Act was signed into law. Oh, at that time, there was an impending CBA negotiation with the union. The bank stopped the CBA negotiations. So the issue here is, can GSIS Family Bank, which is a non-chartered GOCC, negotiate a CBA with its employees? The Supreme Court ruled that GSIS Family Bank can no longer negotiate a CBA with its employees. Why? Because the GOCC Governance Act has provided a compensation and position classification system which applies to all government-owned or controlled corporations, whether chartered or non-chartered. Another illustrative case is the case of PNCC versus NLRC. PNCC was organized under the corporation law. Now, it had a CBA with the union which uh, granted a major bonus to all covered employees. Later, PNCC became government controlled because the government financing institutions acquired 90% of the shares. Now, when the GOCC Governance Act took effect, PNCC stopped paying the mid-year bonus. The NLRC held that the discontinuance of the mid-year bonus was not proper, considering that PNCC, having been created under the corporation law, remains to be a private corporation even though the government is its majority stockholder. So as such, it is still covered by the labor code and not by the civil service law, and therefore the grant of mid-year bonus cannot be withdrawn without violating the principle of non-diminution of benefits. The issues presented to the Supreme Court are, is PNCC a private corporation or a government owned or controlled corporation? Second, are PNCC employees covered by the provisions of the labor code or by the civil service law? The third issue is whether PNCC is governed by the GOCC Governance Act. So what was the ruling of the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court ruled that although organized under the corporation code, PNCC is a non-chartered government on a controlled corporation because it is 90% owned by the government. Now, since PNCC was organized under the corporation code, it is governed by the labor code and not by the civil service law. But although governed by the labor code, PNCC is not exempt from the coverage of the GOCC Governance Act because the said law ordains that no GOCC shall be exempt from the coverage of the compensation and position classification system. So therefore, there is no violation of the non-diminution rule when PNCC stopped granting the major bonus to its employees. I want you to remember that what has been withheld from employees of government owner controlled corporations organized under the corporation law is the right to seek better terms and conditions of employment through collective bargaining, which includes the right to strike and form labor organizations. So, GOCCs, or government owner controlled corporations, organized under the corporation law, are still governed by the labor code. Consequently, other rights and benefits under the labor code continue to be applicable. Although government employees are prohibited from forming or joining a labor organization, they may form associations that contrary to law. They can form associations for the furtherance of their interest and for their mutual aid and protection. But the right of government employees to form associations is not available to the members of the Armed Forces, Bureau of Fire Protection, PNP, and the BJMP, and to high-level managerial employees, including those who hold confidential positions. Labor organizations must be registered. They must be registered with the Department of Labor. Why? To enable it to attain legitimacy and exercise its rights. 
You will recall that as defined by law, legitimate labor organization is a union duly registered with the Department of Labor and includes any branch or local thereof. So, how do labor organizations become a legitimate labor organization? Well, there are two ways. Through independent registration or through affiliation with a duly registered federation. A union that was organized as a corporation does not become a legitimate labor organization. Incorporation merely gives it juridical personality before the regular courts, but it does not entitle such a union to enjoy the rights and privileges accorded by law to legitimate labor organizations, like the, the right to bargain collectively. Unions or labor organizations must be registered. Now, how do you register a union? Well, you have to file an application for registration with the regional office of the Department of Labor for independent unions or to the Bureau of Labor Relations for federations or national unions. The application for registration should be accompanied by the required documents. The application for registration and the supporting documents must be certified under oath by the secretary or treasurer of the union and attested to by the president of the union. Failure to comply with the certification and attestation requirement will result in disapproval of the application for registration. And this certification and attestation requirements must be complied with strictly. Substantial compliance is not enough. So that means that if the documents were merely attested by the union president but not certified under oath by the union secretary or treasurer, the uh, omission is fatal to the acquisition of legitimate status. Conversely, if the documents were merely certified under oath by the union secretary or treasurer but not attested to by the president, the union will not acquire legitimate status. If all the requirements for registration are complied with, then approval of the application for registration is a ministerial duty. So, when do independent unions become a legitimate labor organization? Well, the answer is upon issuance of the certificate of registration. This brings us to the question of, can an independent union file a petition for certification election while waiting for the issuance of the certificate of registration? The answer is yes, provided that the application has no infirmity. This is illustrated by the case of Vassar Industries. In this case, the union, the federation, has a CBA with the company. Prior to the expiration of the CBA, the local chapter is affiliated from the Federation. Now, so the local chapter filed an application for registration supported with the complete documentary requirements. While waiting for the approval of the application, the local union filed a petition for certification election. But the med arbiter dismissed the petition on the ground that the union is not duly registered. The issue is whether the med arbiter was correct in dismissing the petition. The Supreme Court ruled that the med arbiter was not correct. The union can already file a petition for certification election while waiting for the approval of its uh, application. So if an applicant union complies with all the legal requirements for registration, then it is the ministerial duty of the Department of Labor to approve the application. So, therefore, certification election should be ordered. But if the organization itself is defective, as when the applicant for registration is composed of a mixture of rank and file and supervisory employees, the union cannot be allowed to file a petition for certification election. Why? Because the application will certainly be disapproved, and therefore it cannot become a legitimate labor organization. This is exemplified by the case of Toyota. In this case, the union, while waiting for the approval of its application for registration, filed a petition for certification election among the rank-and-file employees of Toyota. Toyota moved for the dismissal of the petition on the ground that the union cannot become a legitimate labor organization because it is composed of a mixture of rank-and-file and supervisory employees. So the issue here is, uh, should the petition for certification election be granted? 
the Supreme Court ruled that the petition should not be granted. Considering that the union's membership contains supervisors, it could not, prior to purging itself of its supervisory employee members, attain the status of a legitimate labor organization. And therefore, not being one, it cannot possess the requisite personality to file a petition for certification election. Let us now move to affiliation board. Can a union become a legitimate labor organization without undergoing the normal registration process? Well, the answer is yes. But how? By affiliating with a duly registered federation or national union, in which case it becomes a local chapter or chartered local. I want you to remember that only duly registered federations or national unions can create local chapters. A trade union center cannot create a local chapter because uh, Article 241 speaks only of federations and national unions. This brings us to the question of when do local chapters become legitimate labor organizations? The answer is when all the required documents have been submitted to the Bureau of Labor Relations. And what are those required documents? First is the charter certificate, then the names and addresses of the officers of the local chapter, and third is the principal office of the local chapter, and fourth, the constitution and bylaws of the local chapter. Can a local chapter file a petition for certification election before the submission of the required documents? The answer is yes, if. Uh, tandaan nyo yung if. If the federation or national union has already issued a charter certificate to it. So the mere issuance of a charter certificate qualifies the local chapter or the federation to file a petition for certification election. Can an independent union affiliate with a federation? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. An independent union can affiliate with a federation or national union, in which case it becomes an affiliate. If an independent union affiliates with a federation or national union, it does not lose its legal personality. If a union affiliates with a federation or national union, it now becomes subject to the constitution and bylaws of the federation. So under this principle, the federation or national union can investigate and expel members of the local union based on the constitution and bylaws of the federation. And um, the relationship between the federation or national union and the local union is that of principal agent. The principal is the local union, while the agent is the federation. Now, this principal agent relationship exists even if the local union is not independently registered. So, if the federation enters into a CBA with a company and uh, signs the CBA, then the federation signs as an agent of the local chapter because the local chapter is still the principal. In case of illegal strike, the liability for damages devolves upon the local union and not upon the federation, even if the federation was the one who signed the notice of strike. So, let's now move to the rights of legitimate labor organization. And we have the right to be certified as bargaining agent, the right to request for audited financial statement, the right to sue and be sued, right to own property, right to tax exemption, and the right to levy special assessments and extraordinary fees. Let us discuss this uh, right to request for audited financial statement. I want you to remember that this right can be availed of only when the legitimate labor organization has already been certified as bargaining agent. But even if already certified as bargaining agent, the right cannot be exercised anytime. It can be exercised only during the freedom period if no petition for certification has been filed by any union or during the CBA negotiations. The right to sue and be sued. 
if the union is not yet certified as a bargaining agent, it can represent or file a suit only on behalf of its members. If the union has already been certified as bargaining agent, it can represent or file a suit not only on behalf of its members, but also on behalf of non-union members covered by the bargaining unit. A legitimate labor organization cannot represent or file a suit on behalf of employees not covered by the bargaining unit, even if the said employees signed the complaint. If a legitimate labor organization will file a suit, it should be brought in its own registered name and not in the name of its president. The union members for whose benefit the action has been filed need not be joined as party, especially when joining the said members will be cumbersome because of their numbers. If the complaint pertains to unpaid wages arising from a CBA, the action may be brought in the name of the union. But if the wages sought to be recovered do not arise from collective bargaining, the union would have no personality to sue for and on behalf of the employees because in that case, the real party in interest would be the employees themselves. So in such a situation, the individual employees concerned should be indicated as party complainants. Next is the right to own property. Legitimate labor organizations can own real or personal property, but the property should be used only for the benefit of the organization and its members. If labor organizations or their auxiliaries will receive donations from foreign entities, they should seek prior permission from the Secretary of Labor. Next is the right to levy special assessments and extraordinary fees. Article 292 authorizes unions to collect reasonable membership fees, union dues, assessments, and fines, and other contributions for labor education, research, uh, welfare funds, strike funds, and other similar activities. But to be valid, for a special assessment to be valid, there are certain requirements that must be complied with. First of which is that the union must call for a general membership meeting for the purpose. Second, a written resolution approving the special assessment must be executed by majority of all the union members during the meeting. Third requirement is that the minutes of the meeting should be recorded by the secretary and attested to by the union president. And the minutes must contain the list of members present, the votes cast, the purpose of the special assessment, and the recipient of the assessment or fees. The law requires strict compliance. Substantial compliance is not sufficient. So, failure to strictly comply with the prescribed requirements will invalidate the special assessment. So, a special assessment obtained in a local membership meeting is null and void because the law requires a general membership meeting. Also, a special assessment based on a written resolution of the majority of the union members present during the meeting is null and void because the law requires approval by majority of all, uh, all union members. Also, a special assessment based merely on the minutes of the meeting is talent point because the law requires a written resolution by the union members and not by a uh, board. Then a special assessment based on a resolution of the board of directors is null and void because the law requires resolution by a majority of all union members. But the right to levy fees and assessments is subject to certain limitations. Foremost of which is that the fees, fines, or forfeitures must not be excessive or arbitrary or oppressive. Second, collection of fees must be done only by those who are authorized by the Constitution and bylaws. And uh, the officer making the collection must issue a receipt and enter it into the records of the organization. 
and the funds must be used only for expenses authorized by the constitution and bylaws of the union or by a majority of union members in a written resolution adopted during the general membership meeting. Expenses must be evidenced by receipts from the person whom the payment was made, indicating the place, date, and purpose of payment. Let us now move to this affiliation. As a rule, a local union can disaffiliate from the mother federation only during the freedom period. Exceptionally, disaffiliation may be done before the freedom period if there is a substantial shift of allegiance on the part of the majority of the members of the union. What are the legal effects of disaffiliation? First is that the relationship between the local union and the federation is severe. And therefore, the federation is divested of the power to represent the local union. Second, the right of the federation to accept federation dues from the local union will cease. So, the obligation of the employer to check off federation dues will also cease. Third, the CBA executed by and between the employer and the federation or national union remains enforceable because the local union being the principal continues to administer the CBA. Fourth, an independent union which disaffiliates from the federation or national union does not lose its legal personality because it has its own registration. Fifth, a local chapter which disaffiliates from the federation or national union loses its legal personality because it has no registration of its own and therefore it must register itself to retain its legal personality. And when a local union disaffiliates during the freedom period and joins another federation or national union, there is no disloyalty because the union is merely exercising its primary right to self-organization. Next is cancellation of registration. The legal personality of a labor organization can only be questioned in an independent petition for cancellation. The validity of the registration of a union cannot be attacked collaterally. On what grounds can the registration be cancelled? Well, we have misrepresentation, false statement or fraud in the adoption or ratification of the constitution and bylaws or election of officers. Second would be the violation of the rights and conditions of union membership. And third, voluntary dissolution. Remember that the grounds to cancel the registration are exclusive. So, if none of these grounds are proven to exist, the registration shall be sustained because of the state policy of giving primacy to the right to self-organization. The registration of a union cannot be cancelled simply because some members of the union do not belong to the bargaining unit. The employees who do not belong to the bargaining unit will just be automatically removed from the list of union members. Now, so, a petition for uh, cancellation was filed. What would be the effect? What would be the effect of cancellation proceeding? Well, the mere filing of a petition for cancellation of registration does not divest the union whose registration is sought to be cancelled of its legitimacy and legal personality. Once a labor organization is registered, it continues to enjoy its legitimacy and legal personality until its certificate of registration is cancelled with finality. In short, only a final order of cancellation can strip a legitimate labor organization of its rights. Therefore, during the pendency of the cancellation proceedings, the labor organization whose uh, registration is sought to be cancelled can still file a petition for certification election. It can negotiate a CBA or even declare a strike. So, what would be the remedy from an order of cancellation? Well, the remedy is appeal. Appeal within 10 days from receipt. Where? Now, if the case was decided by the regional director, the appeal is to the Bureau of Labor Relations. 
Now, if the case was decided by the Bureau of Labor Relations in the exercise of its original, ha, original, not appellate, original jurisdiction, then the appeal is to the Secretary of Labor. Orders issued by the Bureau of Labor Relations in the exercise of its appellate jurisdiction are not appealable. It can be reviewed by the Court of Appeals only through a special civil action for certiorari. This is illustrated by the case of Abbott Laboratories. So Abbott Laboratories uh, filed with the regional office a petition for cancellation of the registration of the union. So the regional director ordered the cancellation of the registration of the union. Now, so the union appealed to the Bureau of Labor Relations. The Bureau of Labor Relations reversed the order of the regional director. Now, from the decision of the Bureau of Labor Relations, Abbott, uh, the company, appealed to the Secretary of Labor. The Secretary of Labor dismissed the appeal on the ground that it has no jurisdiction to review the decision of the Bureau of Labor Relations emanating from the regional office. So, the issue here is, was the Secretary of Labor correct in dismissing the appeal? And the Supreme Court ruled that the Secretary of Labor was correct because the appellate jurisdiction of the Secretary of Labor is limited only to a review of cancellation proceedings decided by the Bureau of Labor Relations in the exercise of its original, original jurisdiction. The Secretary of Labor has no jurisdiction over decisions of the Bureau of Labor Relations rendered in the exercise of its appellate jurisdiction. Now, let's now go to the basic rights of union members. Uh, union members are entitled to fair dealing from the union. The union cannot compromise, cannot enter to a compromise on, on the behalf of its members without the specific authorization from the members. Right to determine major policies. As a rule, major policies affecting the entire membership are to be determined by the union members through secret ballot. Except when secret balloting is rendered impractical because of the nature of the organization or because of force majeure or fortuitous event. In which case, the board of directors may decide on behalf of the general membership. Union members have the right to be informed of their rights and obligations. They have the right to be informed of financial uh, transactions. They have the right to elect union officers. So union officers are to be elected directly by secret ballot at intervals of five years. Now, to run for union office, the candidate must be employed in the company where the union operates. And he must be a member in good standing in the labor organization and must be free from conviction of a crime involving moral turpitude. Or if convicted, he has been granted absolute pardon. Are uh, union officers entitled to compensation? Well, union officers are entitled to compensation only when authorized by the constitution and bylaws or by the majority of the union members. Union officers can be expelled from the union for violating the rights and conditions of membership.